evening. I'm Erin Beveridge, clinical researcher, and on behalf of Canon, I'm delighted to be welcoming you to our second week of our online neurology days. Last week, we spent three days discussing all things stroke, from educational talks to case reviews using some of the best technology and everything in between. Stroke is without doubt super important, but it's not the only neurological disorder that impacts the health of many people. Tonight, we're going to focus on multiple sclerosis a condition that's more chronic in nature and generally affects a different demographic of, from stroke, really hitting people in the prime of their life. And to take this topic on, we have an exceptional panel of, speak panel of speakers lined up this evening, who will each share with us their respective expertise in the use of imaging in the workup of stroke. So with that, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Benoit Doche de Lacuantem. Dr. Dosh is a radiologist from Bordeaux in France, who's very active in the field of neuroradiology. He collaborates regularly with the University Hospital of Bordeaux by attending weekly multidisciplinary epilepsy meetings and monthly multidisciplinary meetings in the field of neuroinflammatory diseases. This undoubtedly makes him second to none to speak to you this evening on the topic of practical imaging of neuroinflammatory disease in daily clinical routine. And with that, I pass the word to you, Dr. Dosh. Hello, my name is Benoît Dosh uh, I will talk to you today about imaging on neuroinflammatory disease in routine clinical practice and uh, with the use of morphological and advanced technique. I am a neurologist uh, in private practice uh, in Bordeaux in a medical group called Imagir. I have a collaboration with Bordeaux University Hospital for multiple sclerosis in relation with a multidisciplinary committee. I'm uh, working uh, on an MRI Vantage uh, Canon, uh, Galan 3T. Um, on the hardware part, I use eight calls of 32 elements and advanced gradients of uh, 45. On the software part, I use deep learning reconstruction, Dynosing, ACE, and uh, advanced acceleration technique like compressed speeder and multiband speeder. And uh, I don't see any difference in my um, own uh, practice between 1.5 and 3T to, for the follow-up of multiple sclerosis patient. So the technique applied in the protocols, uh, I use the French uh, observatory protocol of uh, multiple sclerosis with uh, 3D T1 radiant echo with CS, acceleration technique, the 3D flare with ACE for better resolution, the 3 dt one uh, post gadolinium in spin echo with CS. And uh, I use also diffusion tensor imaging uh, with the use of uh, advanced map that, uh, like uh, FA and colored uh, fiber orientation. So my um, uh, point uh, on this topic will be to go from sequences uh, with 3D flare and 3D DHR for hyper signal, 3D MP2 edge, uh, 2D uh, PD and 2D steer for the hyper signal in spine, 3D T1 spin echo for the enhancement of gadolinium, diffusion DTY also for the new lesion and for the old lesion, I would say, and uh, the co registration follow up uh, with a technique of OLEA uh, with a co registration to see new lesion, and the 3D T1 gradient echo for the follow up of atrophy and the susceptibility weighted imaging uh, for the differential diagnostic and the so-called central VEL cell. So with ACE and uh, acceleration technique like ACE in synergy with CS, we are able to do most of the protocol in less than 10 minutes. Like you see, the 3D flare with ACE is two minutes, 51 seconds. And when we use CS on 3 d T1 um, gradient echo or spin echo, it could be one uh, 30 minutes, one uh, minute 30 seconds, sorry. So ACE, uh, uh, the principle is that you use low signal to noise ratio uh, imaging that you will give to a network uh, of artificial neuron, which is trained with a high IQ target images. And so, this network is uh, trained to do a subtraction of the noise. So here it's a con conventional filter. You will see after the subtraction that you will miss some clinical information. 
with ACE, with the subtraction, you miss only the, no the, the noise only is uh, clean up and uh, no clinical information is missing. And the an accelerator technique I use is compressed speeder. It is based on an undersampling of a case space. And there is a regularization factor to separate the redundant information, the tissue signal from the noise. Uh, and it helps to optimize the settings. And it's a trade-off between uh, to uh, clean uh, the noise from the tissue signal. If your regulation factor is too high, you will miss some clinical information. So the 3D flare, the first sequences, it's uh, isotropic resolution, and it's to see the EPAS intense signal, as you, as you know, uh, to show the dissemination in space. So here you have some periventricular, here some juxtacortical, here some infront anterior and juxtacortical. So that's the dissemination in space uh, with another uh, topic is the spine for the dissemination in space. Uh, I will just uh, uh, focus on the uh, U fibers for the juxtacortical lesion uh, and the use of uh, DIR, double inversion recuperation, and the flare. So here you see a juxtacortical lesion with a normal white mitre interposed between the lesion and the gray matter. So it's a juxtacortical, but U fiber negative. And here is an example in the cerebellum where the juxtacortical lesion is totally close to the gray matter. So there is no white mitre interposed. And you see that the, with the DIR, you have also a good resolution to see that. Uh, the gradient echo could help also in this case, as uh, we, we could see in another, top, in another uh, slide. So uh, for the spinal cord lesions, uh, it's important also to look to the sagittal 3D flare, as you see here in the uh, cervical uh, spine, you see a lesion on the uh, posterior part of the spine. So I use uh, STEER, DP, and uh, MP2 edge. So on the spinal cord lesion, uh, the STEER, uh, uh, I think that uh, sometimes the hypersignal are flu artifacts, flex artifacts, so I have some difficulty with it. So I prefer to use uh, also the proton density, and I notice that I have less uh, flu artifacts in the um, proton density than in the T2 steer. So here you see uh, one lesion uh, which is uh, well uh, seen on the DP and here also. Another example of DP, here in front of C4, uh, you have on the right lateral a, a lesion which is uh, confined also by the axial T2 merge. And you see that with the DP, you have a better uh, viewing of this lesion than on T2 steer, for example. But I use also sagittal and pit rage. So this is a new case where on the spine uh, cervical, you have two lesions on C3 and C4 and C5 around there. Uh, on the DP, you see them, but you see them better in the, with the sagittal and pit rage uh, as a hippo signal. And uh, it's a 3D, so you're able to do axial reconstruction. So it's a kind of a better way, I think, uh, for the future of looking at the spine with uh, more confidence about the lesion. So for new lesion, for the lesion, sorry, on hypersignal, now we are talking about the new lesion with gallium enhancement, the dissemination in time. So I use Pineco, uh, isotropic resolution. Uh, it's, 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 we need to be careful to do the sequences always at the same moment after the injection. So uh, I will do an injection. Uh, the injection was uh, mandatory before. Now it's more a kind of optional injection. I will uh, do it for first examination with a baseline MRI for the follow-up at six months of new treatment of a complication. Um, the diffusion MRI, uh, the new lesion can be uh, seen also as a restriction of diffusion uh, with a low ADC on the map. And here you see the flare and it's, it's kind of blurred uh, for the new lesion, so it can help. So uh, to see new lesion, you can use also advanced post-processing uh, with uh, OLEA uh, sphere, uh, which is based on the uh, co-registration and the differentiation, the difference of intensity between old and new. Here you see a new lesion and with the co-registration and the, the summation of the two flare, you see the new lesion with, which is in high signal in comparison with the rare. 
another example of one new lesion here, one new lesion here. You see the new lesion here, the new lesion here. And you see that uh, they are brighter on the co-registration with uh, advanced processing of volume. Another example here is uh, a new lesion with gadolinium enhancement. You see here the enhancement, and it was difficult to, to see around the ventricle, uh, the occipital ventricle here, and you see that it's bright. Here it's a choroid plexus, so it's not a lesion, but uh, it's bright and it's a new uh, just here that you don't see on the sagittal. So for uh, other sequences, morphological study, I resume 3T1 gradient echo. Here is a, it's a man of 37 year old. The resolution is uh, nearly isotropic. And you see the uh, smaller uh, capus callosum. You see uh, smaller uh, cerebellum. You see uh, lar large size. So the cortical fitness can be also uh, studied with a diminution. And there is a correlation between the cortical lesion and the atrophy progression. So the problem with the uh, follow-up of uh, atrophy is that it's first a qualitative uh, uh, su subjective evaluation with large suicides, the corpocalosum, the breastum, the, this volume, and the rheumatoid atrophy uh, has a higher clinical implication for cognitive struggle and physical impairment. But the quantitative tools uh, with a follow-up of global volume of segmentation with the white and rheumatoid and the volume of white and green method, it's tricky because the reliability is difficult. There will be variation during the day of the volume of the brain, variation with the treatment. A treatment if it's efficient, you will, you will have a lower atrophy, and also variation with brain stimulant. So the reliability of all of this is it's quite difficult. And uh, for the tool of diffusion, you can use it also for axonal damage, like black hole. And all lesion will be a black hole. It will be hyper-intense on T1, like here, and uh, is iso-intense or normal on diffusion with higher ADC and a lower F1, like on the orientation color map. Uh, there is a few phenotypes of uh, disease like relapsing and meeting, secondary progressive and primary progressive. You can see some difference between subtype, but on the relax, relapsing and meeting, uh, the brain lesion are, are predominant, the lesion are predominant in the brain and uh, the atrophy is predominant in periventricular. ventricular. On uh, progressive primary, the lesion are predominant in the spine, but there is a dissociation with the lesion burnout and the clinical deficit. Uh, I will focus also on susceptibility weighting imaging. It's a uh, help for differential diagnostic, uh, and I use uh, SWE EPI, FIBB, and FSBB. The resolution is high, and uh, I look at the sign of a central vent sign in the lesion, one hypo-intense signal central on two orthogonal planes. Here you see this low black point inside the lesion. And uh, here it's example um, from an article uh, which was a kind of consensus article on the central vein sign. And you see that you need to have two orthogonal uh, hypo signal inside the region to, to say that it is probably inflammatory. And uh, in ischemia and migraine, you don't have hypo signal usually. So the specificity of this hypo signal inside the lesion, the eye signal is better when you are away from ventricles because uh, close to ventricle, you, you expect to see that. And this is the name of the article I recommend you to read about the central vein sign. You can have a chronic active lesion, which is a hot topic in MS actually, an hypo intense rim around the lesion for the, it's more frequent in progressive uh, MS. Uh, here is an example of diagnostic differential. We we'll see that uh, it's uh, only small vessel disease, uh, phase cas grade 3. There is no radial hyper signal, no central vessel sign, and no U fibers, which, is, uh, which are positive. No, no, no positive uh, U fibers. Another example is uh, just hypertension with phase cas grade 1. And uh, again, you don't see uh, black uh, uh, dot inside the lesion. And there was a complex CVM left and everything. Uh, for the MC differential, you can use also advanced technique. Here it was a leucopathy with your, without clear etiology in the 20 years, 22 years old. And the spectroscopy just shows something what we could expect, a small calling peak and a small uh, low NR, but not, not, nothing special to, to differentiate between uh, uh, clear disease. Uh, another example of article I recommend you to read is this one from Brain, and uh, it's very good to understand which is uh, clearly a sclerosis uh, uh, MS and, and uh, which is not. So green flags, periventricular, 
and uh, red flags. For example, on this one, it's paraventricular, and uh, on the basal ganglia, so it's more microangiopathy. On the D, it's um, more uh, 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 posterior diencephalic, so it's more in favor on the neuromilic optic, uh, pro probably with RS postrema, so aquaporin. Um, on F, uh, it's uh, central on the corpus callosum, so it's uh, more um, in favor of Suzak. And uh, on E, it's, you see that you have a lesion on the temporal pole, so it's in favor of Canazil. Uh, another example for juxtacortical, uh, the green flag we have seen, it's uh, U-fiber positive with a DIR, but uh, on the red flags, it's microangiopathy here, which is subcortical and basal ganglion. Uh, a a PML, you have a lesion which is at the border with white matter and gray matter, which is blurred, and uh, probably some anomaly in diffusion, and uh, at the beginning, uh, no enhancement. Here it's an example of microbleed on G, and on H is an example of microbleed, which is hyper signal T1. Well, there is no susceptibility imaging, but it could have been better with this, and uh, uh, you expect uh, vascularities with that. Uh, for inflammatory tentorial, in central points is microangiopathy. Uh, the region of uh, MS will be more peripheral, like this. And uh, for CDA, it's uh, peri-ependymol uh, on IRA prostrema. Uh, diencephal, and this is uh, more characteristic on normalite optechis. And on if it's large lesion on the uh, four ventricle, it's uh, more like a beset. So uh, to finish, uh, we'll talk about the uh, structural radiologic report. Uh, we need to be uh, reliable for the neurologist with, uh, I, I would say, the same thing, uh, always the same time. So the number of lesions, the new lesion, the cerebral volume probably with a quantitative follow-up also, and the number of lesions get plus. So it's a consensus statement about also what should be a radiologic report. It's very interesting to write this one also. And to finish, I will talk about uh, automatic follow-up and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, probably more efficiency, more fiability. It is coming, but it is not probably uh, for tomorrow, but perhaps after tomorrow, and this paper is very good. So thank you for your attention. And it's just another example of a synthetic flare 2D with Nova Plus uh, with ACE of OLEA. And here you have the flare, the original and in uh, reconstruction axial. And here the synthetic flare. And you see that there is a match between the lesion and synthetic and uh, the flare. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dosh, for that wonderful presentation such a great insight, not only to how you're using imaging in your clinical practice, but also how AI and these new innovative technologies can play a role in improving workflows. It's great to see that reducing acquisition time does not have to mean reduction in imaging quality. Now, it's no secret, of course, that MRI is the cornerstone of MS clinical workup, but what if there was another viewpoint for looking at brain changes? Well, our next speaker may just be able to shed some light on that. On that note, I'm honoured to introduce to you our second speaker of the evening, Professor Bart van Weymers, a neurologist who is dedicated to advancing research in MS. I could likely give you my own talk on all of his accolades, so let me just pick a few. He is the medical director of the University MS Centre in Pelt in Belgium, where he leads the multidisciplinary MS team. He's an associate professor of neurology at the University of Hasselt, where he's involved in preclinical and clinical research on MS. He also has an educational role in the Faculty of Medicine and Physiotherapy. He was the co-founder and first president of Paradigms Foundation, an organization dedicated to the education of MS to improve everyday clinical care of people with MS. Somewhat unsurprisingly, as acknowledgement of his scientific work, he received an honorary award of the Flemish government in the summer of 2019. He doesn't stop there though. He's also currently preparing to run a marathon for MS. But for this evening, Professor Van Weymers is going to talk to us about the use of optical coherence tomography, OCT, and MS care. And now I hand to you, Professor Van Weymers. So thank you, Erin, for this very kind introduction. Uh, um, I'll try to say something about the current use of uh, OCT in multiple sclerosis. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, 
before I go into OCT, I wanted to just give a small introduction on multiple sclerosis, because if we want to understand what OCT can do for us, uh, it's good to distinguish the most uh, important factors on pathology of multiple sclerosis. Um, there is a preclinical phase uh, of multiple sclerosis in which the disease starts and gives some lesions inside the brain, and sometimes then there can be a first um, symptom, uh, which at that point one calls it a clinically isolated syndrome. And when it repeats itself, it becomes relapsing remitting MS, and uh, later on it can get other forms. Um, there is a combination of inflammation, uh, which has been nicely shown uh, by Dr. Dosh on, on MRI, uh, numerous inflammatory lesions. But at the same time, there is also uh, axonal loss and demyelination leading to a kind of neurodegeneration and brain atrophy. Now, this seems to be um, uh, apart from each other, but in, 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 in real time, it's not. It's, it's running... Uh, uh, through each other. Um, and in, in red, you can see uh, this is over time, and yet you can see relapses. And there is a line of clinical threshold. So some relapses, some lesions inside brain, spinal cord, or, or optical uh, uh, nerve um, are, are not um, felt by the patient. Uh, so it, it, it remains subclinical. Uh, and you can see that on MRI by having different lesions, but over time there is also brain atrophy. So the atrophy um, gains sets in and you lose brain volume over time. And this is only what the patient feels. So there is a, a big pile below the clinical threshold that you don't see. So in this way, one pathogenesis can cause different expressions like relapsing remitting MS, um, in between the relapses, uh, it's quite stable, but after maybe about 15 to 20 years on a mean side, it, it, it can gradually decline as we've seen because atrophy uh, and neurodegeneration is, is mostly present and not so much inflammatory lesions anymore. So, uh, and sometimes the first phase is all subclinical and then you end up with primary progressive MS having progression from onset, mostly there are a little bit older patients that had a subclinical relapsing phase. So apart from the focal inflammatory lesions, so in green you see in the white matter uh, and orange you see in the gray matter, so cortical gray matter lesions, which uh, for example are not very well shown on MRI, even though double inversion recovery uh, is already somewhat better, but still it's, it remains about 80% of lesions are not seen, and the blue ones are in the deep gray matter. But then you see all these black dots uh, inside the brain and also outside in the brain in the meninges. There will be diffuse inflammation, organized inflammation that keeps on smoldering. So you have like a smoldering disease, a smoldering lesions that are still present there. And it's kind of this diffuse inflammation that forms the basis of ongoing brain atrophy. Now, the brain volume itself starts quite normally, even in the CIS, but then uh, as it goes on, there is a progressive decline of uh, brain volume. And this goes on at the rate that is three or four times as fast than in healthy controls. So due to the diffuse inflammation, you get a lot of stress on your environment in the brain, and you see that normally you should have below 0.4% of brain atrophy per year, but in MS, it's higher, it's up to about 1% sometimes. Um, and this correlates very well with physical and cognitive disability. So if you summarize and you see cort the, the cortex and the white matter with, uh, for example, three neurons here and the axons, which are myelinated in blue by the oligodendrocytes, and then you have the astrocytes and the microglia in green. So what we see is that Inflammatory lesions are focal in the white matter, but also focal in the gray matter, but sometimes uh, lesions outside uh, the cortex, uh, very close to the, 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 the surface. Uh, but then also diffuse inflammation is present. And this has two uh, consequences. That's one that the environment is changing. So astrocytes and microglia are becoming stressed and they have a different morphology. 
And at the same time, there is demyelination and this in all together gives neurodegeneration. So we lose axons and neurons. In the first time, why the immune system goes into the brain, spinal cord or optical nerve. These are the three parts where MS plays a role. And then lesions are formed, like we have seen. Over time, uh, it seems to die out. That means that the immune system is not going for new lesions. But um, if nothing is done, then, then the immune system has built itself up inside the brain. And behind this closed blood-brain barrier, the diffuse inflammation and a smoldering disease can be present. And that's what is called in progressive MS. Uh, fortunately, we have MS treatment, but it works best inside blood, for example, on the immune system, stopping uh, relapsing remitting MS. But it's far more difficult in progressive cases because there you probably need to go inside the brain and try to stop it there, which is much more difficult. So with that being said, let's take a look at optical coherence tomography, what it can uh, bring for us. And that is... Um, what is that? Well, it's just a, a, a way of structurally, um, ultra-structurally, I say, having a look at the retina. Um, um, I won't bother you with all the techniques, uh, but um, what you can see is the different layers of the human retina. And the most important ones for MS is the retinal nerve fiber layer, the first one, so all the axons of the, the, the ganglion cells, so the ganglion cell uh, uh, layer. Then you have the inner plexiform layer and the inner nuclear layer. These are the most important ones for the MS, of course, there are the other ones as well. And so on an, uh, uh, in, in MS, you can see changes. Uh, for example, this is mild and, and, and severe, and 80% of patients have atrophy in the retinal nerve fiber layer and the ganglion cell layer, which is here seen a little bit, uh, but here very much, there is almost no retinal nerve fiber layer anymore and, and, and ganglion cells have been uh, completely damaged. Uh, also 40% of patients have problems with their inner nuclear layer. Um, and this is what you can see on OCT because OCT is, uh, uh, yeah, th there is possibility to show that in, in real life. Now you can use OCT in MS in three ways, a diagnostic way, which is not so surprising because uh, one of the features often seen in MS on the first symptoms are optic neuritis, but also on prognostic level and, and then on follow-up of treatments or follow-up of these patients over time, uh, we still lack uh, good biomarkers to, to show our neurodegeneration. So for example, diagnostic, you know, optic neuritis uh, and, 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 and the most common way of measuring that is a visual evoke potential and is still very sensitive for it. A uh, patient looks at, uh, at a dashboard, uh, which flickers, and then uh, electrodes are placed on the occipital lobe, and you can see the electrical uh, current in the brain. And, and when you add that, you have a visual evoke potential with about normal 100 milliseconds. But in on the right eye, it's 148 milliseconds, which is slow by, as a cause of demyelination. Sometimes you see a lot of uh, edema in the papillar uh, region. Um, in terms of OCT, of course, you can see uh, changes, um, but also in, in patients with clinically isolated syndrome. So that's, so that's the first onset of multiple sclerosis or even not yet diagnosed, the first inflammation. Sometimes this is optic neuritis and sometimes not. Now, in the green and purple bars or dots here, these are patients with optic neuritis and the, the blue ones are not so without optic neuritis, but having a clinically isolated syndrome and other symptoms like motor or sensory. And still in these patients, you see differences in the average uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness early on in the first stage of MS. Also, uh, total micular volume will be decreased. Of course, this helps you with diagnosing, uh, but also with prognosis, and we will see that in a minute. Now they looked, they, they made different maps of, of whole the retina and looked at retinal nerve fiber layer, a ganglion cellar, inner plexal layer, and in, inner nuclear layer. And one of the most sensitive 
Layers was the ganglion cell la layer that seems to be thinning even in patients that have no optic neuritis uh, and, and, and no uh, abnormality on a visual evoked potential. So that's, that's quite uh, stunning even. So the first way you can see it is probably the ganglion cell layer. With, and, and this correlates very well with another study that showed that ganglion cell layer and inner plexiform layer um, correlates the best with the visual acuity. Here you see two types of visual testings. Uh, the lower part is the low contrast, uh, uh, which, which is most sensitive for optic neuritis. And you see um, if you have less uh, ganglion cell layer, inner plexiform layer, uh, you also have less visual acuity. Um, now, apart from diagnosing, uh, don't think that's the major chain, biggest achievement of OCT, but I think the, the, the next following is the prognostic and the follow-up of patients with OCT. I think that can be a very big impact in clinical practice. And for example, this is because there is a good correlation between what happens on the retina and what happens inside the brain in MS. For example here, OCT, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, and uh, brain atrophy. So here you have relapsing, remitting patients from different ages or disease, but here you have brain paracrural fractions. So you can see already by the naked eye that there is atrophy over time. And this correlates very much with the, the, the loss of retinal nerve fiber layer uh, thickness over time. So the, the smaller that is, the more atrophy there is. Also another study showing that there is association between retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and brain parenchymal fraction. So brain atrophy correlates very well with what happens inside the retina. So you can use that um, by trying to um, do two things. Doing prognosis on the patients with a clinically isolated syndrome towards their MS evolution. This is a study, this is a Spanish study from Cilia in, in, in Madrid. They followed 24 patients, 30% patients uh, having reduced uh, uh, retinal nerve fiber layer. And what they showed was that if you have one red sector, at least in the retinal nerve fiber layer thinning, so one uh, great impact, um, then um, you have 80% of evolution towards MS. Uh, which if you take that on towards the classical MRI criteria or oligocranial bands on the liquor criteria, you see that's a specificity of about 50 to 60% and, 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 and also quite okay sensitivity. Now, it's always putting all the dots together, but that this can help you with that. Uh, also, um, very much important, I think, is prognostic relevance of retinal nerve fiber layer thinning in, yeah, at baseline. It's a very good study um, that looked at uh, at baseline. Uh, so when you diagnose a patient with MS at baseline, you measure retinal nerve fiber layer. And if you see that it's lower than 87 or 88 microns, depending on which kind of device you use, um, then if you only look at... Um, the first um, two years down the road, then you see that there is a double risk of having disability increase. Uh, if you look at it over, uh, over uh, three to five years down the road, you can see already the, the, the risk going uh, nearly uh, uh, four times higher of developing uh, disability. So if you see somebody with a very low written nerve fiber layer, this means that there is a lot of brain damage already done. So there is less brain reserve and you have a, 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 a worse prognosis in MS. I think that's very important to guide your treatment. Um, one of the, I think maybe most promising or, or things to really look out for the future is to follow up uh, written on nerve fiber layer measurements over time. Now, when you look at brain atrophy over time, you see that it declines, but in an individual, uh, as Dr. Dos has already explained, it's very, uh, it's unreliable. That means there is a lot of fluctuations even during the day in one patient. So uh, even when there's 1% of fluctuation, you cannot um, be sure that there's, um, yeah, that it's just fluctuation or really damage. Now, what they did here is look at 
retinal nerve fiber layer and also ganglion cell uh, nerve plexiform layers. And for example, here PRI is progression independent of relapse activity. And that's what we want to have. We want to de detect progression that's independent of relapses, so pure neurodegeneration. And I hope to detect it before the patient really feels it. So what you see on the right side here is that patients that had no uh, progression whatsoever were stable on their retinal nerve fiber layer or uh, ganglion inner plexiform layer. But patients that did have progression outside of relapses, they showed a decline of their thickness uh, of retinal nerve fiber or ganglion in plexiform layers, um, which also uh, correlates with EDSS worsening, for example, but not with relapses. So that means that if you see a patient declining, but yeah, it's from two or, or only two microns, it's very, uh, very, very uh, subtle. So if, if you see three or four or five microns each year going down that retinal nerve fiber layer, uh, without the patient really complaining or changing a lot, then you know that probably this is a smoldering disease. And I think that uh, if we confirm that in more studies is, is really something for the future, because I believe that this might be uh, useful in the, in the individual patient. Um, Next one, for example, is just a teaser also uh, to, to follow up response on treatment with retinal nerve fiber layer. This is a poster uh, during uh, in 2016 already on, on, on the American Academy of Neurology uh, conference. And this just showed that if you treat patients uh, aggressively, this is with a very powerful immunosuppressant, alemtuzumab, um, then they see that in all eyes, which they followed up at baseline versus two years down the road, that there even was a, an increase in their retinal nerve fiber layer again. Even in patients that had optic neuritis eyes, it's also an increase. So that means that even if we, if we then stop the disease very well, that there can be some restoration and that um, the, the further decline of the loss of neurons, even in the retina is, is, is stopped, which is probably a, a, a representation of what happens inside the brain. So just to summarize, I um, hope they have shown you that, that retinal changes in MS are a result of inflammation. Um, uh, and a typical example is optic neuritis and, and neurodegeneration, which is shown by brain atrophy. Now, OCT shows loss of retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cellar and in inner plexiform layers thickness. Uh, in optic neuritis very early on. Um, this thinning has uh, prognostic value at baseline regarding future disability accumulation. So it can tell you what will probably is at risk at the future, but it also correlates very well with brain atrophy and then can demonstrate disease progression independent of relapses, uh, which is something that's very hard to, to, to predict. Uh, we try to find new biomarkers, for example, in liquor or, or serum with neurofilament, etc. but this might be also a very good way. So in this way, OCT changes in retinal nerve fiber or ganglion cell layer uh, can help you in guiding your treatment choices as baseline to take uh, into account the prognosis, but also uh, follow-up patient and, and treatment responses in multiple sclerosis. So I think it's really a, a tool for the future. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and welcome any questions later on. Thank you, Professor Van Wagmers, for giving us that window to the brain. Really, really fascinating stuff. It's really encouraging to see the progress in this field and the developments pushing the boundaries of the MS care forward. And without doubt, these advances of new ways to look at the problem are exciting, but that's not to say we're done with MRI. It really seems that the toolkit we're going to need for MS is going to be multimodality. And MR also cont continues to advance, which brings us nicely to our third and final speaker for the evening. Last but no means least, I'm delighted to introduce you to Professor Tomas Torrias, another of Bordeaux's brightest, Professor Tourdias is a professor of radiology at Bordeaux University Hospital in France. He's qualified as a radiologist in 2008. In parallel, he obtained a PhD in basic neurosciences in 2011. He then conducted a postdoc fellowship at Stanford University in the US to work on 7T magnet in 2012 and 13. 
It was during this time he developed his expertise in clinical neuroimaging, basic neurosciences and MR physics. Now, as well as his current clinical role, he's con conducting research in the team INSERM in connection with the Institute of Bioimaging, where he leads a scientific program on personalized medicine guided by imaging. This evening, he's going to share with you his vast expertise by talking to us about advanced imaging and MS. The floor is yours, Professor Turdias. So, hello everyone. And yes, indeed, I was asked to discuss uh, the possible added value of some more advanced uh, MRI technique uh, in MS. So this is, in fact, a broad topic and I could definitely show uh, all, all what can be done. So I chose to pick few sequences that are typically not performed in clinical routine, but that could be useful to capture all the hallmark of MS. I mean, not only the white matter, but also gray matter lesion, meningeal inflammation, and diffuse and subtle inflammation. So starting with uh, uh, white matter lesion, this uh, 3D flare, this is the basic and recommended sequence. But what is a bit more advanced, it has already been introduced by the first speaker, is knows the capability to, to get very, very, really super fast 3D flare, and then to recover a, a enough signal uh, with the noising using a deep learning based reconstruction. And this is typically what we have done in this uh, recent uh, study in which we have scanned uh, MS patient with four different versions of flare from a standard to a super fast one. And this obviously comes uh, with noise, with decreased Im image quality, and with a shadowing of this lesion. But as you can see, uh, DLR helps to uh, recover uh, the, the quality. And you can see that this uh, two minute scan plus DLR, that is ER, is even better than the uh, standard flare. But what is more important is that uh, uh, when you accelerate, in fact, the, the capability to depict lesion decrease. But uh, this is improved with DLR up to the level of the standard flare for this fast and ultra fast uh, sequence. So for the typical example are this. Uh, subtle lesions that are missed by the reader uh, when he looked at the ultra-fast sequence, but, it, but the reader uh, captured this uh, lesion when he looked at the same sequence after DLR in a random order. So this strategy like fast imaging plus DLR, this is an advanced strategy that is already routine uh, for some of us and that is likely uh, to, to, to be developed with this kind of uh, validation study. So problem with this uh, basic sequence, flare T1, T1 gadolinium, is that this is not very specific for the subtype of uh, MS lesion. It's true, you know that, that when you have uh, an early and active lesion, it can show a gadolinium enhancement. When you have a chronic and inactive lesion, this is a rather strongly hypo T1, but all the other one cannot be characterized. While in, in fact, you've got some histological subtype that could be of interest, and especially there, there is this mixed subtype, uh, mixed active inactive, you have an inactive center, but you have also permanent activity at the periphery. So it could be interesting to capture this subtype. And because uh, at the periphery, this RAIM uh, uh, show in fact microglia and macrophage that are iron rich, in fact, so susceptibility based imaging has been used. And uh, first at 70, it has been shown that you can have some lesion with a RIM that is IPO on T2 star and even better seen on phase imaging. This is interesting because now with our better 3D magnet, we can run a 3D T2 star. We can post process a susceptibility with the image or our QSM here. And sometimes we can see this RIM that is supposed to represent this mixed lesion. Why this is interesting? This is interesting because this subtype uh, are supposed to be lesions that are going to expand slowly and to evolve toward uh, severe destruction. So this is a nice example from the literature where you can see a, a lesion with a rim that uh, in fact slowly expand over years and become strongly hypo T1. And also at the patient level, it has been shown that when you have a lot of this lesion, more than four, you are more li likely to, to, to develop motor or, or cognitive impairment. So this is a, a severity information. And also on top of that, on top of this severity information, this uh, pattern also provides some specificity to MS, so it can help uh, the diagnosis. And here, uh, this is in conjunction with an other pattern that has also been described by the first speakers, that is uh, uh, development around a central vein. 
because you know that uh, inflammation spread around this central vein. And again, with uh, T2 stars, uh, for the first time at 70, it has been shown that you can identify that. And most it has been shown that most of the MS lesion have this pattern as compared to non-MS lesion. But now with our uh, more advanced 3T, we can also get the same semiology. We can identify this donut or this coffee bean sign uh, that, that, that is representative of this central vein. And in this uh, European multicenter uh, trial that has been conducted at 3T, it has been shown that when you have more than 35% of lesion with the this sign, or uh, more simply, uh, just more than three lesion, you have pretty good specificity for the diagnosis of MS. So this T2 star, this is helpful for severity, helpful for difficult diagnosis uh, to, to characterize the white matter lesion. But Advanced methods are probably even more important for, for gray matter lesion because uh, as already explained by, by the other speaker, gray matter is really part of MS. It starts early, it progresses around the course of the disease. It can affect all the gray matter. It, it can be focal lesion within the cortex. So in the you, you can have uh, uh, focal demyelination that are uh, in between white and gray that ca can be purely intracortical or even this superior demyelination. You can also have this uh, focal uh, demyelinating lesion within deep nuclei here of the thalamus. But you know that these lesions are typically missed with uh, flare because there is few myelin in the cortex. So uh, uh, in fact, few contrast in case of demyelination and this, the lesions are less inflammatory. So here, you know that double inversion recovery could be helpful. It's true that when you use a standard flare, you, you have just one uh, inversion pulse and you collect the image when uh, the CSF, uh, the signal of CSF crosses the zero, but with double inversion recovery, after this first stage of recovery, in fact, you invert again, and then you are going to collect the signal at a specific point where both CSF and white matter is neural. So the only remaining signal that is here, that is not very big, it comes from, from the gray matter. So you, you've got a better contrast and it um, might also improve visibility of gray matter lesion. So we can now uh, collect pretty good double inversion recovery with our uh, 3T magnet. And it's helpful to uh, identify this kind of tiny uh, uh, gray matter a uh, lesion with more confidence than what we could do uh, based only on flare. But you have to keep in mind that this is not very easy to read, in fact, an uh, agreement between expert reader uh, for the validation of a, a lesion on a double inversion recovery is not so high. And in a pathological study, it has been shown that specificity is very good, which means when you have a lesion, this is a true lesion, but as already mentioned, sensitivity stays quite low, which means that you have a lot of this cortical lesion, even with the blood inversion recoveries that are not, that are not seen. So this is why we consider that we capture only uh, the tip of the iceberg. So this is already useful because this is probably uh, 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 an indication of the true histological lesion load, but that means that there is room for, for, for improvement. And uh, regarding improvement, one interesting strategy could be to use some variation uh, around T1, such as the, this, this kind of white matter newel T1. So T1, but with a very short inversion time to newel the white matter. So in fact, I, I worked uh, in the past in this with this type of sequence to, to uh, uh, and after several optimization, uh, especially, especially to, to maximize visualization of the thalamus that is otherwise very poorly identified. So I conducted this initial optimization at seven Tesla and uh, at seven Tesla, we could uh, show that with this type of sequence, uh, yes, you can have pretty good contrast between adjacent nucleus. You can even show thin bands around some of them, and you can even manually delineate uh, several uh, nucleus in close correlation with the histological atlas. Uh, we uh, even uh, use this manual delineation to train an algorithm so that the, the algorithm is going to use this prior to automatically segment new cases. So we call this uh, automatic segmentation, Thomas. And uh, regarding MS, uh, what is interesting is that on top of this anatomical contrast, it, it, we, we could show that this was also very useful to capture gray matter lesion. Here are some examples of lesion within the thalamus that are really better seen with this method than with conventional uh, sequence. 
and uh, in conjunction with the, the automatic identification of the, the nucleus, uh, we could uh, describe the predominant pattern of the lesion that are mostly uh, regarding the thalamus around the third ventricle with this kind of bone-like uh, lesion. What is interesting is that this sequence that we uh, initially optimized at 70, we could rapidly transfer that to 3T thanks to uh, adjustment of the parameters, thanks to other uh, improvements such as this radial fumbling K-space segmentation, which means that we can now get pretty good white matter neural T1 at 3T. Uh, again, double inversion recovery is useful to, 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 to improve image quality. We can, with that, get this same type of anatomical contrast. And it seems to be helpful to capture this tiny uh, gray matter lesion here within the cortex, here within the thalamus, close to what we were uh, show, what I showed you with the uh, 70. Uh, with this type of sequence, we can also get automatic delineation of the thalamus because our algorithms that has been trained at 70 works uh, good when you give the, uh, some 3D image to the algorithm, which is probably useful because, in fact, atrophy of the thalamus is one of, of the uh, important predictor of future uh, uh, disability. So many possibilities to, to have a better uh, look at gray matter lesion. Uh, just a, a rapid word to mention that meningeal inflammation has uh, been described in, in post-mortem brain of this uh, MS patient. These are this type of uh, uh, follicle that are uh, made of uh, aggregate of B and T lymphocyte that are supposed to secrete a cytokine and alter the underlying cortex. And it has been described that when you uh, perform a flare uh, several minutes after injection, at least 10 minutes, uh, you, you can have this focal uh, enhancement that are supposed to, to represent this uh, um, follicle. We have also identified this kind of, of focal leptomeningeal enhancement uh, in our experience only with this delayed uh, flare post gadolinium, but probably more work is needed to really understand uh, the meaning, the, 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 the signification of this um, pattern. And also you have to keep in mind that there are several pitfalls that have been described, especially the, the enhancement of veins. And finally, but importantly, uh, there are many of these advanced techniques that are really useful to capture the diffuse modification that have been introduced just before. So, so uh, as already mentioned, uh, you know that uh, there is not only this focal uh, infiltration of macrophages with this focal demyelination, but from there, you have this cytokine, chemokine that diffuse, and that are going to activate microglial cell really diffusely. And when microglial cells are really overactivated, it can promote phagocytosis, phagocytosis of uh, uh, dendritic element, uh, phagocytosis of spine. So which means that uh, diffusely within the white matter, within the gray matter, you can have this enlarged and activated microglial cell. You can have this damaged neuron. And this is typically invisible with uh, anatomical and conventional image. But we can uh, try to estimate that with more quantitative method. I'm going to talk briefly of uh, two of them, that is diffusion and magnetization transfer imaging. So diffusion, you know that the principle is to uh, put this uh, gradient on top of a T2 sequence and to study the signal loss induced by this gradient then that comes on top of the T2 decay. And this signal loss is proportional to a microscopic movement of water and provide information on the tissue microstructure. What is interesting is that with uh, advanced uh, magnet, we can have we can now have a very strong gradient. The, the, the peak amplitude of our gradient is 100 millitesla per meter, which means that we can uh, uh, induce very strong uh, diffusion gradient while the, the TE is the same. So we can have uh, more diffusion weighting uh, uh, higher B value, but uh, we still pretty good SNR uh, because the T2 decay is not increased as this would have been if we would have uh, increased the echo time. Why this is interesting to go to this higher diffusion, higher B value? Uh, because as you know, at low B value, in fact, uh, you are sensitive to rapid water diffusion. But at higher B value, you are much more sensitive to slow water diffusion, that is water that is associated with cell. So higher B value is more representative of, of, of cellular component. And in case of disease, it can induce some abnormality at post, low, and high B value, but probably some subtle disease like microglial activation, neuronal loss, might be only captured at higher B value. 
And this is in fact uh, exactly what we have demonstrated in this uh, animal study of uh, MS, in which we have shown that this, all these dendrites that are lost diffusely uh, uh, in case of MS, uh, because there is dendritic loss, there is a decrease of uh, water directionality, but this is only captured at high P value and not a standard B value. And also in LC patient, we, we have shown recently that uh, the subtle modification of the myelin within the cortex, you can estimate that with this kind of uh, surfacic diffusion map, but only if you do IB value. And if you are at low B value, there is no correlation between the, the va diffusion value uh, and this myelo architecture. So again, IB value is useful to, to, to capture subtle modification. So that's why it can be useful to, to collect more or shells with higher B value. Of course, when you are at this high B value, the signal decay is no more linear. So you have to, to, to take more uh, advanced model. Uh, one of them, Nodi, might be uh, clinically feasible because you just need one low B value and one high B value. And from that, voxel by voxel, you can uh, model that there is three, three components, free water, water diffusing within the right, water diffusing outside the right. And from that, you can compute Narrative density index map, orientation dispersion. It can be useful to uh, characterize the lesion, but also to uh, capture subtle and diffuse modification. And in this recent paper, it has been shown that the narrative density index decrease outside the lesion uh, diffusely in the brain compared to, to control and also in the spinal cord and that this is correlated with EDSS. In the last uh, few minutes, uh, after diffusion, I like to talk about another technique uh, that is magnetization transfer imaging. Uh, you know that the principle is that uh, the, the free water uh, provide most of our signal in MR, and in fact, the resonance frequency of this free water is narrow around the, the uh, Larmor frequency. But there is also another pool that is water bound to, to membrane. And uh, this pool, in fact, has a very short T2, so this is uh, basically invisible. But in fact, the resonance frequency of this pool is uh, broad and this spam over uh, several kilohertz. So that means that if we apply a, a radio frequency pulse uh, with an offset, offset uh, compared to, to the frequency of Lamar, we can saturate this bound pool. And then the saturation is going to be transferred to, to the free pool. So this is a magnetization transfer effect, which means that the signal of the free pool is going to decrease, which is measurable, and we could quantify that, uh, for instance, with this metric MTR. So MTR is directly proportional to the bound pool, so proportional to the membrane. So that's why MTR is pretty high in normal tissue, but it's going to decrease when you have even subtle demyelination axonal loss. So it can capture a subtle and diffuse modification, but it can also increase in case of uh, more cells. So you can say this is sensitive, but this is also maybe non-specific. And regarding this problem of specificity, uh, there is a new and more advanced approach that could be of interest. And, and the, the, the observation, interesting observation, is that uh, if you apply an offset that is negative, and then exactly the same offset but positive, in fact, the amount of decrease is not the same. There is an asymmetry. And it has been shown that this asymmetry is, in fact, really related to myelin. So the more you have an asymmetry between a positive and a negative offset, and the more you have myelin. So with more advanced uh, a pulse sequence with negative positive offset, you can compute what is called the inhomogeneous magnetization transfer that is supposed to be more myelin specific. So we can now collect that. It's a bit more uh, complicated. You need to have the sequence without the pulse, the, then with a positive negative offset, the dual pulse. But you can, we can get that in reasonable scan time. And it has been shown in the literature that it could be helpful to capture a subtle and diffuse, modif diffuse modification, if you are better than classical MTR. And um, it might be better correlated uh, to a, a clinical score as compared to MTR. So just to summarize, I, this is what I wanted to show, that there is really a, a big panel of methods that could be useful to, to get all the hallmark of MS. I just go through some of them, but there are many others. With that, I'd like to, to thank all my colleagues in Bordeaux. Thanks also the engineer from Canon who are supporting with our research magnet that is in this institute. And I thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Professor Tereus, for that wonderful presentation. You really gave us the, the whole picture about what's possible to see using MRI beyond just the typical white matter lesions we, we know so well. Um, so now I'd like to invite back all the speakers, though, so we can start the live Q&A. We have some time to answer some of the many questions that have been coming in during the session. Um, so we've had quite a few questions um, Professor Van Weymers around the use of OCT imaging, particularly what is the frequency of follow-up for using OCT if there's a nerve fiber layer thinning? Um, well, I, I think at, at present there are no real studies that say how, how fast or how what you should do, but um, we are currently doing that annually. So doing an OCT scan, it only takes you 10 minutes, let's say, depending on how, how broad you want to measure it. But, uh, and, and one time a year, I think is good, uh, especially if you want to uh, look at changes in, in the thinning of the retinal nerve fiber layer or ganglion cell layer. Um, in terms of following up, uh, having an idea on, on neurodegeneration. So once a year, I think is, is enough. Of course, when there are, for example, new symptoms like an optic neuritis or, or, or after a relapse, you might want to do a kind of re-baseline to see whether what, if there were any changes after that relapse to compare it. Um, but I think it's very, it can be very good in patients that do not have inflammatory disease activity. I mean, that do not have relapses anymore and, and and you say, are these stable or are these progressing? I'm treating them. It's, it's sometimes it's very hard because their their clinical appearance fluctuates also. So and then then these are slow processes. So once a year, I think is enough. Okay, great, thank you. And just to follow up on the topic of the nerve fiber layer thinning, someone's asking, what's the difference in thinning with MS versus glaucoma and high myopia, where they'll also see the, the thinning of the nerve fiber layer? Well, I, I'm 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 not a, a an ophthalmologist, so we, we don't see a lot of glaucoma or, or other causes of, of uh, RNF thinning. Um, but I think that it's easy. I think it's quite easy to exclude glaucoma or or other ophthalmological causes because there are other ways, and that um, if that that it's. It's part of the complex puzzle of trying to follow up a patient. For example, for now, it's not like a diabetes patient where you where you check for the blood and you see what what's their uh, um, glucose levels has been in the last months or or um, uh, hemoglobin uh, structure uh, over time, uh, and that tells you okay this is okay. So then your treatment is okay uh, in MS. Looking at the patient clinically, looking with MRI. If you something structural, uh, looking with other stuff like evoke potentials, and then OCT might add something that is not seen or not reliable in any other cases. So if you have um, an MS patient and you see this thinning, um, and and then you say, okay, this says something about how bad is MS, and when you can follow up. In, in, in time, then uh, it adds something to your, your uh, evaluation of the patient. So as long as they're not one biomarker that, um, th that is sensitive enough for disease activity uh, in saying that if that marker is okay, everything is okay, I think we need a very broad and deep uh, look at the patient. And, and for that, OCT can be of added value. I'm not saying it's replacing anything, but it's it's adding something where it's, uh, we can help you in deciding, uh, is this patient really on progression uh, or am I, or, or is he just, does he need rehabilitation and, and, and that's enough or, or do, does he really need new treatment uh, with new treatments coming on for progressive disease? This can be very important. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so another question we have in here, um, Dr. Dosh, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned you don't see much difference between 1.5T and 3T for the follow-up. Are there circumstances in which you would prefer to go to 3T? Uh, I would say to 
for diag differential diagnostic, for example, to use uh, probably with uh, better resolution the susceptibility with imaging when I'm looking for the central vaccine. But honestly, uh, surprisingly, because I, in a way, I didn't believe it at the beginning, uh, with a 3D to 1.5 to see the impact signal, if you have a good 3D flare, I, I don't see much difference. And I'm, I'm not, I'm comfortable to, to follow up a patient at 1.5 then 3T and uh, it works well, I think. Okay, great, thank you. And for Professor Turdias, what sequence would, for you would be most important for initial diagnosis? And if you had to make a choice to replace one, which one would be more important than the others? And would it be the same for follow-up? Oh, yeah. I, I think we need to, to differentiate what is the basic, the, the recommendation, of course, 3D flare. This is what is recommended and we all should do 3D flare. And I mean, not only flare, but 3D flare. This is probably the, the most important. You know, a few years ago, we were doing 2D. We, we know that 3D is really helpful, especially for follow-up because we can co-register. So this is really is the, the most important sequence. Then, and it, when you look at international recommendation, this 3D flare comes first, then T1 for atrophy, but we know this is a difficult, and maybe not very reliable. That, that's why OCT makes sense. So 3D flare T1, but all the advanced seconds that I discuss currently they are not recommended. It can be helpful in some particular situation. They can be helpful for clinical research, but so far they are probably not at the maturity where you can disseminate them really broadly, even though some of them are pretty good, like double inversion recovery, but this is, they are still optional. But the, the basic that all uh, of us should do is this 3D flare. I think we can get pretty good 3D flare in most of the magnets right now. Perfect, thank you. And I guess a bit of a, a follow-up to that. Do you expect to see um, revision of the guidelines sometime soon to incorporate use of maybe some of these more advanced sequences and, oh, and maybe even open course. that question up to including OCT as well? Of course, of course, of course. Uh, we, 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 yeah, I discuss different methods that are coming that provide additional information with maybe different sensitivity. So of course, maybe they, 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 they will be recommended in the near future, especially also Dr. Dosh showed some image of spinal cord, which is a really uh, difficult uh, situation. So far, it is recommended to be T2, but it showed an interesting image with stir with this MP2 edge. They, they, they are, they are, it's difficult to, to, to have a reproducible uh, protocol with this type of uh, sequence, but when you have something that works well in your center, this is good. That's probably why so far it's not recommended broadly, but probably it's going to be in the near future, of course. Great, thank you very much. Um, and Dr. Dosh, you, you mentioned briefly about the use of AI systems for differential diagnosis. Do you think this is where the, the value of automa automated solutions lie um, within MS? So rather than tasks maybe like detection or classification, um, is it about this kind of differential diagnosis where you see the value for AI? AI, it's, uh, I think AI will come and uh, probably I, I, I don't know, but I think that AI will help radiologists for the follow-up, for the detection of new lesion because uh, I've shown the lobby system, uh, the OLEA system of uh, longitudinal uh, follow-up. And uh, I guess that for this, um, it's a uh, beginning of a new era because probably that at what point doing a, a MRI on MS will be a follow-up done by AI perhaps and the radiologists will use advanced sequences as Thomas told us uh, to do diagnostic differential but we will save time because it's a kind of repeated task to detect new lesion and uh, probably AI is better than a human or Human will be better with AI. It would be a radiology augmented, an advanced uh, augmented radiologist. So I, I believe in AI for the follow up at the beginning. At the beginning. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, I think we're pretty much out of time. But um, I 
like to again thank all three of you for joining us this evening, both for the wonderful presentations and also for the discussion at the end. It's quite amazing what we can learn in just one hour when we have such great presenters. And it's really great to be able to bring together this multimodality solution to tackle some of these tough problems in, in MS. And it's this wonderful combination of both being able to visualize new imaging features and also have entirely new ways to look for them. Um, so seeing all these new developments gives real hope that MS care is going to keep moving forwards and ultimately going to make a real difference to those living with the conditions. So thank you again. So tomorrow is our final evening of neurology days and we're going to move from the central nervous system to take a closer look at peripheral nerve disease. And we have another two exceptional speakers lined up to share their knowledge. In particular, they're going to talk about how ultrasound could be a game changer in the peripheral nerve disease diagnostics. So please do join us then. Thank you all for joining and I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.